Good evening, friends. As we gather in this space, we remember the words of Psalm 23, which connect tonight to our gospel lesson we'll hear. And these words paraphrased by Isaac Watts in 1719. He was considered sort of the reviver of the words of the Psalms and made them contemporary in his day, but as we sing tonight, I invite you to notice how these words from 200 years ago plus resonate still with us. Let's sing together. Let's put those slides up. Thank you. 
next slide, we are justice our creator creator of all things we come to you with humbled hearts ready to receive a word from your servant father our lord our creator our mother we thank you for the privilege that you've given us to come to worship you from wherever we may be in this world right now, in whatever space that we are in. Open our ears, Holy Spirit, our minds and our hearts to receive the word that the Lord wants to place upon our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus, our good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for us, that we pray. Amen. to describe a quality of relationship. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. One who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his sheep his own, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. 
Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the divine parent knows me and I know the true parent of all. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the parent of all loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my divine parent. May God bless these words to our understanding. The biblical scholar Phyllis Tribble has written many books, but one that I have a fondness for, if you can call it that, is her book, Texts of Terror. The texts that she is referring to are texts that are and have been used to undergird patriarchy and the power of the masculine in understanding the world. The Bible is a book that not only justifies patriarchy, it justifies colonialism. It is a book for colonizing. And John 10, 1 to 18 is a text for colonizers. It is for me a text of terror. Every time I hear it, no matter if it's from the gentle voice of Sarah it makes my stomach clench, and it makes my mouth so, uh, sour. I do not like this text. It helps the world justify, colon, helps us to colonize the rest of the world. It's a beautiful text about Jesus and God and colonization. So you ask, then why, Damianti, are you preaching for it? I want to see if we can find something else in this text of terror, like Phyllis Tribble found in her text of terror, is there something else that we can hear other than go out and make everybody sheep of our shepherd? Or let our shepherd take over the world and make it one. Now, I'm going to be very clear. Those words are in the text. I am making no illusions, they are not. This is not, we misunderstood the text. The text is a colonizing text. John is a colonizing gospel. I make no illusions about it. But I want to go into its space and see if we can find some redemption in it. Because, as we know, that which we are not willing to revisit becomes the weapon of somebody else. So if you don't turn a, pow uh, a sword into a plowshare, a sword is how it will be used. Right? So let's go to the text. Let's play with it. As Dr. Mancan knows, I'm the daughter of a biblical scholar. So I stick to the Bible and see what I can do with it. Um, I stick to other texts too, but today I will stick to your Christian text and see how we can decolonize it. Um, the key purpose of the John uh, 10 text is found in John 10b. 
I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We are trying to figure out how is life abundant possible? The text has mixed metaphors. And as a theologian that became a theologian through the history of religions, mixing metaphors frustrates me because they're saying opposite things at the same time. Um, and being able to pull them apart and play with them separately is often helpful. One metaphor that you find in this pericope is the gate. Particularly in John 10, 7 to 9, so Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me, came before me are thieves and bandits. The sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Interesting metaphor. But at the same time, the text says, I am the shepherd. Gate or shepherd, they're different things. Just thinking out loud. Um, so in John 10, 11 and forward, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep and sees the wolf coming and leaves and the, sh and the, sh the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I will lay down my life for the sheep. I also have other sheep who do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they, they too will listen to my voice. Let's look at these metaphors. Gate and shepherd. The gate is a metaphor of means. How to make relationships. Go through this gate and you have good relationships. Right? It's about a how. It's a how text. Um, so how do you, how do you go, go about relationship so eventually, so that you will have abundant life? If you do these things, a lo abundant life is possible. The shepherd, however, is about substance. What does a relationship look like in abundant life? Different things, yes? Why it's good not to mix them so quickly. The juxtaposition of the true shepherd is to the hired hand. The hired hand doesn't work because it's in a relationship. It works to get paid. Right? It's, it, it's, it's a clientele relationship. You pay me, I do the job. If I don't pay me, that's the relationship, right? Um, therefore, the hired hand does not belong to the sheep, and the sheep do not belong to her. Right? There is no relationship there, so in a time of peril, she runs away, because not mine, not paid to die for this, I'm leaving. Right? It's, re it's really that simple. I'm not putting my life in peril for things that don't belong to me. I just get paid to take care of them. Right? Again, there's another mixing of metaphors. So the hired hand then becomes thieves and bandits. That's another sermon that Dr. Grundy told me to preach one sermon, so I'll just preach one. Okay, I'll preach this one another day. <laughs> Maybe next year, Dr. Grundy. Um, but the shepherd is the shep herd. The name of those to whom she belongs is in her very name. The primary relationship is with the sheep, not doing it for pay, doing it for the relationship. 
Um, I've had many a conversation, as I'm sure have Dr. Grundy and Dr. McCann and Dr. Weisbaker about, you know, I am your client. I pay you to do this. And my response is, is this a client salesman relationship or is this, do we belong to each other? If your professors belong to you and you belong to us, there's a different relationship going on, right? The parent language is the same. How much should your parent pay you to be their child or how much should you pay your parent to be your, their, your parent? I'm sure Dr. Grundy and Dr. McCann may have a figure in mind that they want to ask their children. But that's not how that works. It works like the shepherd. I'm the father or mother of my children. I'm a shepherd of my sheep. We belong to each other. So in times of peril, they put themselves with and in front of their sheep. They lay, this, and this is, they, this is not, I want to die. It's like, you got to get through me to get to them. So the shepherd, rather than the gate, tells you the substance of relationship. It's not transactionary. It is inter, uh, interrelationship, right? Um, and that is why the sheep trust her. Not here to get paid. I'm here because I belong to you. The shepherd belongs to you. You belong to the shepherd. Let's go deeper into the conversation of means and substance. Means are about the rules of relationship. How do you make a relationship work? because my mind works this way, I, I went to another place where you get rules of relationship. Emily Post instructs the American uh, commu uh, society on, how, on the rules of relationship. To be correct, she instructs immigrants on how to function in the civilized world. Marry that with gate language. Go through this gate in this way, and you are part of the people, of the sheep, right? Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Emily Post. She's a late 1800 socialite. She comes from the upper echelons of society. Her father was a wealthy coal baron. Her husband was a prominent banker. Her function was to write books to bring the great unwashed into proper glitterati society, or at least clean them up so the, that real society could abide to be around them. Think about that. Think about gate, and think about how you want to make sure that the unwashed heathen are at least able to be smelled in your presence. Acts, uh, uh, John 10 has that tonality. That's why I hate it so. But, and the, the gate functions that way. And that's why we like it. As good colonizing people, we want to tell everybody, if you follow these rules, all will be well. I'm going to go there. If you're always wearing your mask and you're six feet apart, nobody will get COVID. And if you don't get the shot, nobody, I want you to know, I know a bunch of people have gotten caught. Will it make you safer? Yes. But if you think that the rules are going to make this crazy world okay, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. It doesn't work that way. You do the best for the substance of the relationship. The rules won't fix it. The relationship itself will help you get through it, right? Um, substance is how do we belong to each other? Will we put ourselves, like our shepherd, in danger for each other? Do we act like those sheep? Do we belong, do we act like our shepherd? So you may not come through that gate, but you understand what the shepherd 
is asking of you. The key is to find the means by which you can live in that substance. That gate may not be the way, and if it isn't, find another way to get to substance. The substance is what... So, if you are given the perfect recipe to bake a cake, and the cake doesn't get baked, maybe, I don't know, use a different recipe. If this way that we're saying is the way to do it isn't your way, find another way. Because God is big enough for that. You're big enough for that. Right? Hear, hear the soft voice. This is John 10, 16. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. Don't come through this gate. Not, shepherd, not my sheep from this flock. Right? I must bring them along also. They will listen to my voice. The one who teaches substance can teach substance any way she wants. She doesn't have to do it the way you learned how to do it. That's important. Now, there is the colonizing part in the text. I told you, this is a colonizing text. I'm picking to try and find some redemption in it. Right? It does say, so they can all be one flock, one shepherd. Maybe. It would be easier for us if they'd all be like us. But there's a chance they might not. And the shepherd's okay with it. It would be easier. Now, if all of you thought, like me as a good theologian, and you could just learn my ways, life would be better. But I'm thinking you won't. And I'm thinking God is okay with that. And I promise you that is the gift. The substance is, will this allow you to love each other to the point that you belong to each other and belong to God, whatever her name may be, or belong to the path that allows you life abundant. There will be colonization. Bible does it well. Bible has redemption too, which is why, like my colleagues, I don't give up on her entirely. Is, she, is it still going to make my stomach clench and my mouth sour, uh, sour? Yes. But even this colonizing text has a redemptive word. So there you go. Thanks be to God. Mike is on, but uh, what does relationship look like in abundant life? And friends online, can you just give me a thumbs up? Are you hearing me okay? Is it distorted? Thank you. We had a little audio issue earlier. St. Teresa of Calcutta wrote these words, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And I wonder if we could just sit with those words and remind ourselves tonight. We belong to each other. And get a good breath before each phrase. We belong to each other. Feel your feet on the floor. Breathing in, breathing out. And sing with me again. We belong to each other. Each other. 
you to take a moment and to think of the thing that might feel most distant from you in this moment. Would you imagine that thing come close? Maybe that's a person. Could be perhaps an inner struggle, an idea, uh, striving for peace, for quiet. And imagine that that thing is real in you in this moment. We belong to each other. One more time. We belong to each other. you to look around this room at those who are here in the zoom space that you're in in this chapel we belong to each other and would you even bring to mind perhaps those who are not here but who we are close to in heart or in body Let's sing again, we belong to each other. have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Is this microphone on? Thank you for that mantra. Something that we can carry with us as we go from this place. Our thanks to Dr. Niles for being our preacher today. Our thanks to all of our uh, participants in worship who are with us online from different places in the country, and our, our appreciation for our worship leaders this morning uh, who led us. Uh, before we go, uh, Jay, I may need a hand mic. Uh, for this. Are there, are there any announcements? Is there anything happening soon uh, in the life of our community um, that we might need to uh, hear about? I will mention that there is also chapel tomorrow. I invite you to come back for chapel tomorrow. <laughs> if you bring up Paul's mic, I think we can use that. Other announcements? Uh, 
I've been announcing the crop walk now for several days, and I'm going to keep on doing that for the next three weeks. But uh, I want to, if Nicole and Jacob are still on, I want to thank Nicole. Nicole has created an Eden 